Good evening, everyone. God blessings to you to tonight. And as we journey um, in this Lenten season, I hope that uh, whatever you're using for your daily devotion uh, has been blessed, has been a blessing to you and also your family. Um, you know, some people do their devotion alone, some people do their devotions with their family. So however you do it, I hope that you are um, having a blessed um, Lenten journey all the way to Calvary. So we welcome you here to our uh, week, mid-week service um, in the sanctuary. We hope that uh, your time here will be a blessed uh, blessing for you and for those you're going to share this word to throughout the week. Let us rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our psalm this afternoon of confession is Psalm 51, verses 10 through 19. We read responsibly. <clears throat> Create in me a clean heart, O God. Cast me not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. And sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your grace. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Then will you delight in right sacrifices. Let us pray. Direct us, O Lord, in all your doing, with your most gracious favor, and further us with your continual help, that in all our works, begun, continued, and ended in you, we may glorify your holy name, and finally, by your mercy, obtain eternal salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now we stand for the gospel. Our gospel lesson is found in the book, Good News According to St. John, chapter 9, verses 1 to 12. The Holy Gospel According to St. John, the third chapter. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day... We must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him. Wash in the pool of Shiloh, Shiloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claim that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. 
But he himself ins uh, insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened? They asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Shiloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Amen. You may be seated. Again, every time you have a chance to read the, the gospel, you feel like you cannot afford to just leave it alone and then not talk about it. But for us tonight, is about we are, we are in the book of James, but at home you can go again, reflect on these words that we read from, uh, from John. But you heard the text from James this afternoon, earlier, James chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. Um, James, again, continued to have the church leave a life that reflects God in everything that we do. So we saw James well talk about if we have faith, we need to show that faith so the world can see faith in us. And that's something that we are fighting to do. Not something that, oh, we are trying to do something so people can see what we're doing. No. Because of God's grace in us, because God's put faith in us, automatically we start doing good works. But in chapter 3, we just read, James is talking about something different, but connected to that same message he's trying to convey. Who, who is wise and understanding among you? That's his question. So let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. This is the word of God. So, in the Jewish culture, or even in human culture in general, we, we like to have knowledge. We like to know about things. We like to know about the world around us. This is not a bad thing. But at the same time, when you have knowledge, you also need to have wisdom so that you use this knowledge appropriately. You use this knowledge not for your selfish reason. You use this knowledge not to enrich yourself for your own gain. But you use this uh, knowledge to help not only yourself, but also people around you. But James here is talking about two kinds of wisdom. Yes, knowledge is important, but let's put knowledge aside now we're talking about wisdom. So the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. And we know what the wisdom of the world leads to and we know what the wisdom of God leads to. So if you go uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, the text says, uh, For those who are perishing, the word of God is foolishness. But for those of us who have been saved... 
the word of God is the power of God for salvation for all who believe in him. So James, in his text, trying to help us understand or contrast three things. The first one is contrast wisdom origin. So where does the wisdom of the world come from? And where does the wisdom of God come from? So with, according to James, there are two kinds of wisdom, true wisdom and false wisdom. One comes from above and the other from below. And heavenly wisdom, which the one that comes from above is heavenly wisdom, and the one comes from below is man-made wisdom. So the wisdom of men rely on what we call reason. For you, if something doesn't make sense to you, there's no way you will try to get it from somebody who is trying to teach it to you. For you, you need to see. For you, you need to see the facts, and then you put the facts together. Then, as a, as a human, you'll be like, that makes sense to me. Now I can get your message. But if the message cannot make sense, if you don't see um, facts and you don't see evidence of what I'm teaching, you'll be like confused. You'll be like, what are you saying? What are you talking about? So man-made wisdom always leads to failure because they're looking for something tangible. They're looking for facts so that they can believe. There are many examples in the Bible that support such claims. So you don't need to go too far. In the Bible, first so in, in the beginning in Genesis, you saw the people realized, well, we are so comfortable here. Because we are so comfortable, what we're going to do, we're going to build ourselves a tower where we're going to live together and then we're going to build it all the way to heaven. So those who came with this idea said, yes, that's a good idea. Let's do it. And they were not only talking about it, they start doing it. They were not only saying, oh, what about, how about if we do this? No, they not only talk about it, but they said, we are going to do it. Everyone was excited about, about it. They thought it was a good idea. But I don't need to tell you the story. I don't need to tell you the rest of the story. You know how this thing happened. And God saw they were determined but the, that wisdom was foolishness because that was not God's plan. God put confusion into their heart, and then there was division, and they never get into that plan they had. So another example is that when David and Saul and the people of Israel faced with the Philistine. And they have this great giant who no one could defeat. So now they had a challenge for the people of Israel. Whoever is able to defeat that guy, all of our people will bow before Israel. But this guy was not only giant, he was strong, no one would defeat him. And even the king did not know what to do about it. But David, as a man of God, who realized how insulting that was for one man to challenge the people of God. So he said, I am going to do something about it. So notice that David did not say, I am strong enough. I'm going to do something about it. But he said, because they are insulting the people of God. I will do something about it. So that means he count on God to help him do this. And Saul realized, oh, okay. So if you decide to volunteer yourself to go fight, I will help you. In my wisdom, I want you to put my armor on you. And then with my armor, you will be able to beat that guy. So notice, let's think about it. For many months, the challenge was there. And the king never come forward and said, oh, I will do the fight. I will fight Goliath. But once David volunteered himself, and then now he realized, oh, my armor will help you beat this guy. Oh, my armor will protect you. No. 
So the wisdom that Saul tried to put forward was foolishness because David did not want a human shield to help him because he knew he was going to fight these guys not with his strength, not with his knowledge, not with his armor, but he was going to fight this giant with the word of God. And that's another failure example we see where humans think they can do things their own way. And then God came in, showed them that they were wrong. And David won the battle, not because he had dressed properly, but because he counted on God, on God's wisdom to, to win the fight. And finally, after a long day of preaching and sharing the good news um, about the kingdom of God, the crowd in the New Testament, uh, mind you, the disciples, their wisdom saying that, oh, we need to send these people away so that they can go find food at home so they can eat. In our understanding, that makes sense. These people have been out for the whole day in front of Jesus, listening to Jesus, listening to what Jesus was saying. And now, yeah, they're hungry, but we don't have any food here. Uh, how are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're not going to le- let them here. So we need to send them back home so they can get food. But that was not God's idea. Jesus, with a little bit of bread and a little bit of fish, he fed more than 5,000 people right then and there. That, for those who do not believe, that was foolishness. For Jesus to say, okay, give me this, uh, this loaf of bread and then this fish, I will give you food. Oh, the entire uh, uh, people that was there, the entire uh, followers that was there. But again, the human wisdom and God's wisdom are opposite. Because in our wisdom, we think we need to see what we have in front of us so we can decide what we do. But the wisdom of God is by revelation. You do not need to see. But by His word, you'll understand. By His word, you will be able to do what is right. So now, let's not go into the Bible. If you even look into your own life, you will find sometimes you want to do things your own way. Sometimes you want to do things you think, yes, that's the right thing to do. I'm going to go to school. And then from the get-go, when you said, I want to be an engineer, or you said, I want to be a doctor, or you said, I want to be a nurse, or I want to be everything. And then that's the human talking into you. But where God said, I have a plan for you. If you go into Jeremiah 29, verse 11, God said, I know the plan that I have for each and every one of you here. And that plan is not a plan where you will fail. God's plan is a plan that will give you success, is a plan that will give you a life that not only will take care of yourself, but also that life you'll be able to take care of your neighbors. So it's not only about you, but it's about People, God blessing you so that you can bless people around you. So God has a plan for you. God has a plan for every single one of us. The only thing, how are we listening to God? Are we listening to God? Are we listening to what God is telling us? Are we listening? Are we listening to what God or the direction God is giving us? Sometimes we want to go our own way, but again, when we follow God's direction, you'll see your life will be very easy. Your life will be easy. You'll be, you'll, you, will even not, you will not understand why you are so happy. You will not understand what's happening in your life, but it's, not, it's because you did not follow your own desire. So there is the contrast between the origin. So the, 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 the wisdom of the world is coming from uh, yourself because sometimes you want to follow your own flesh, your own desire. Or sometimes it's the devil because in Genesis, 
when Satan came to uh, Eve, said, Huh, is God said, do not eat from this tree? And uh, Eve said, yes. And the devil said, no, that's not true. He doesn't want you to become like him. But if you become like him, and then you will not need him anymore, so he wants you to stop to not eat that fruit. But the result, you know what happened. Because Eve did not want to listen to God, and he wanted to listen to the devil. And now we all are paying the price of this sin. And there is, again, what we call, besides having um, the differences between the origin of wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world, we have also the contrast around the, um, what happened when we follow our own desire, when we are follow the wisdom of the world, when we follow the wisdom of the world, there's something that's happening to us. And when we follow the wisdom of the world, we become envy. We envy others. So if we see somebody have something, you want to have it too. Or you want to harm the person so you can have it yourself. The other thing is that when you follow the wisdom of the world, you become, you, there's strife. So there's fights going on. There's disorder going on in our life, especially in the church life. Sometimes when we do, when we do not following God's uh, wisdom, sometimes there's fight going on between us. There's boasting. Sometimes you feel like I am the only one. If I'm not here, everything will go uh, uh, down. If I'm not here, everything will break down. So you're boasting in yourself, and there's sometimes deceit. Sometimes when you think things are not going your way, you even go to the point to lie so that you can get your way. But when you follow the wisdom of God, there is something we call meekness. And the word said meekness is not weakness, because power... Witness, well, meekness is power under control. There's a lot you can do. So you see someone very skinny come to you and try to uh, mess with you, but in a second you could just break that person and then you throw them away. But because of God's wisdom in you, you practice meekness. It is not because you are weak, but because the fruit of the Spirit is in you. And when you follow God's wisdom, there is something called purity. Because God is holy, so wisdom from above is pure. So when you get wisdom from God, you have a pure heart. And also we have peace. For you, instead of fighting, you always try to promote peace. And there's gentleness. Gentleness does not cause fight nor compromise the truth. So when you are gentle, that doesn't mean you let people pass over you. When you are gentle, you, you, that doesn't mean you compromise the truth that is in you, but you want to listen. You want to give the person an opportunity to talk also, and then you can let them see reason. Compliance, able to hear all sides while holding on to the truth and your conviction. So you're not going to compromise your truth, but you comply so you, can keep, so you can keep the peace. And there is mercy. The mercy of God is in you. And also, you have good fruits. Remember, James talked about if you have faith, and then your faith should, should show your, by the fruit that you have. So you, can have a, you, can, you cannot have a tree, or it's not the tree that tells you uh, what tree it is. It's, you know the tree by its fruit. If I go to a tree and I see a mango fruit, and I know that's a mango tree. An apple fruit, I know that's an apple tree. So when you give good fruits, so that tells you that there is wisdom of God in you. So also there is contrast in outcome. First of all, there is contrast in the origin. So the human uh, wisdom is from the flesh, from the devil, and from our desire. But the 
human, I mean, the uh, wisdom of God is coming from above, from God. But there's also contrast in um, what we exhibit. There's contrast in what we say. But also there's contrast is in outcome. So those who follow the world uh, desire, they'll go in failure. Those who follow the world desire, or they have envy all the time. They have confusion. Remember earlier we said the people, when they wanted to build this tower, and at the end of it, they all got confused. Confusion was in uh, between them because it was not wisdom of God. So confusion. So the text means when you say confusion, there is disorder. But the Christian life is a life of sowing and reaping. So that means whoever you are, you sow something in your life. And then what you sow, that's what you will reap. So now, if you sow according to the wisdom of the world, and then your life will end in failure. But if you sow according to the wisdom of God, you will have all these things we talk about peace, joy, and also blessedness, and all the give good fruits. You'll have all these things when you follow the wisdom of God. So James is trying to build the church in a way so that wherever we are, people will see we are Christian. James is trying to uh, help the church to keep the uh, uh, God first. So when you keep God first, the world will see you. When you keep God first in your life, the world will see, yes, you are different. When you keep God's word or God's wisdom in your life, the world will see that you're not the same as them. Because for them, they have their own priorities. But for us who are Christian, we have our also priority. So it is important for us today, like James said, to understand the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. Because if we are in the wisdom of the world, yes, the knowledge we will have about God will mean nothing to us. Because if with the wisdom of the world, when we know about God, we, want, we, will, we will try to say, yeah, we can do better. We can do better on our own. We don't need God. We can do our own thing. So, we can, so that's why now we see the world, a lot of young people now, they don't care about the church. Because for them, yeah, we know God. But there's the wisdom of the world that says, I can do my own thing. There's the wisdom of the world that says, I can get to the top. So while I was in class with Dr. Elshelbach, he talked about the Red Pyramid and also a green V. So the Red Pyramid is the world. We all want to get on top. We, want, we all want to get the promotion. We all want to get on top, even if we mess up somebody else, even if we hurt somebody else. For us, it's going is to get to the top, because that's what the world offers. The world said, you have to do your best to get to the top. However you get there, you have to go get to the top. But when we talk about the green V, the green V we see, so it's going from there to bottom. And then where do we see God? He said, we see God down there. So that means while you're here to find God, it's not going all the way to the pyramid, but to find God is, uh, is to go down. So everybody can be on top of you, but you know down there, that's where God is. So God holds the world in his hand. So to find God, you have to stay in his word. To find God, to find the wisdom of God is to stay in his word. And then what is the what is the beginning of wisdom? The beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. When you fear God, that's where you start to know about God's wisdom. And then, who is the number one person who expressed God's wisdom in our life? It is no one, no other than his son, Jesus Christ. He sent him. And then you see how Jesus lived his life. Not according to the world wisdom, but all he did was according to his Father in heaven. And that's why the world could not understand him. 
That's why the people who knows about God, the people who know the, the law, they could not understand why this guy is sitting with these Pharisees or why this guy is sitting with these sinners, why this guy is sitting with tax collectors. I want you to say you are from God, you are the son of God, but if you knew who God was, you would not be sitting with this person. You would not be uh, uh, sitting in this person's house because their logic, their uh, 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 worldly uh, wisdom tell them something different about God. And when we see God, Jesus came to seek the lost, those who do not know him, those who do not have hope for eternal life, because the way the teachers of the law was teaching God, these people, for them, they said, okay, it's not going to happen. We will never inherit eternal life. Because we know our life, and then this guy says, if we are living that way, there's no way we can have eternal life. But Jesus came, he changes the story. Jesus said, while we were still sinners, he died for us. That's the wisdom of God. James is talking about today. Whoever you are, God loves you. Whoever you are, God has a plan for you, a plan to give you a future, but most importantly, a plan to give you eternal life. And to finish, Proverbs 3 verse 13 said, Blessed the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. And all this, we can find them in the wisdom that comes from above. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for your word. And thank you for your wisdom. And thank you, Lord God, for giving us the opportunity this mo- uh, today to hear your word. The opportunity to know that the wisdom of the world will end in failure. But your wisdom will lead us to eternal life. Your wisdom will lead us to the way of the cross where your son, Jesus Christ, died not only for the Jews but also for the Gentiles. And today we are part of these Gentiles who are also here to celebrate your name and to also journey with you while you go into Calvary and to understand what you have done for us It is not a little thing. To understand that because of your death and resurrection, we have eternal life today. Not in the future, but today. And thank you for this assurance, Lord God. And we pray that we continue as ambassadors, as witnesses, continue to share this good news to everyone around us until you say to us, well done, thy good and faithful servant. We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us rise. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the gift of divine peace and pardon, with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the Holy Christian Church, here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this nation, And for our cities and communities, and for for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, For reasonable wealth, for reasonable weather, and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. And for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, For all those in need, 
for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. For the sick and dying, and for all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. For these and for all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Amen. Now we receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his consonants upon you and give you peace. Amen. Sing our closing hymn. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid, I think I've lost my way, still you have right beside me. And nothing will I fear, as long as you are near, please be near me till the end. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now I will not forget my heart forever is wandering. Jesus be my God and hold me to your side. And I will love. a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.